I really appreciate it. And for our folks in Worcester, good morning. And I hope everybody enjoys today's symposium. Um, the title of today's symposium really sets the theme for the upcoming topics this year. And it's about building your career and the skill sets that you'll need for your career. And so with that in mind, we already have a facilitator for our first workshop. We're hoping for the end of May, beginning of June. And that's going to be on strategies for effective negotiations. And it's a topic in which, including myself, struggle in. And so um, we hope that people attend and there'll be information forthcoming. In that regard, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Christine Doherty with us. And Christine is a vice president at Tyson Foods for sustainable food, um, sustainable food production. Um, she has had a very varied career. Um, she has her doctorate, and she's also an attorney, and has used both degrees at different times in her life, and has changed careers many times. She was a research scientist working on experiments for the Space Shuttle Columbia, and then she shifted gears and actually became a patent attorney and worked in a private law firm and had personal life changes as well during that time. And then she joined the Tyson Food family in 2003. If I say things incorrectly, please correct, correct me. And she has served many roles with Tyson. I first got to know when she was working with Cobb Vantress, which is a major poultry genetics development firm, one of the world's largest. And um, at that time, she was chief um, technical information officer and was working on a grant contract of mine. And um, her name made me nervous at that point, actually, and in the litigation and so on to get that contract through with OSU. And then she switched into a research role um, with Cobb and then went to the parent company, Tyson Foods, and has been involved with animal well-being programs, um, director of intellectual property, um, and finally has switched into her current role. And so this summer, when I saw at poultry science meetings, um, we had a lovely conversation, and I told her about my new role, and that was leading the gender initiative, and she told me she was creating a new canvas too. And so during our conversation, she said, if you ever need any help from me, please let me know. So I took her up on that when we decided to run a very large symposium to kick off the Agenda Initiative. And her talk is entitled The Crooked Path. And unlike other talks that you attend, this talk's going to be run a little different. Um, Dr. Diardi would love to have conversation during this talk. So if you have any questions before she begins, during her talk or after her talk, we've scheduled plenty of time for conversation. So please converse with her during this at any time. Um, it would really benefit everyone because I'm sure if it's a question that you have about something in her life that's gone on and how she's handled it, other people do too. And the mission of our gender initiative is about retention and support. We're trying to help people make those right and left turns in their career so they can stay on track and not get lost. There's a lot of things that come at us from various angles, and many of us, including myself, have thought, this isn't for me, I can't, can't put up with this anymore, I just need to go another route. And I was very fortunate to have good mentors that kept me on track so I could reach that end goal and without that support, I wouldn't have been here. So we want to support people and help people, and that's why we're doing the skill sessions, because they're areas where everybody needs help. And so this is not a typical scientific talk where we wait and absorb the data. Please ask questions at any time. So without any further delay, I'm going to introduce Dr. Diardi, 
And you also need to give her a round of applause for her persistence in traveling to get here yesterday. It was an ordeal. And we had backup plans for an audio feed, and she persisted and didn't head home. Chris? Thank you. That's good. All right. Hello, Wooster. I know that you've got more snow. I will try to not move out of the camera too much. The, the camera people, I've learned um, when you start walking around, it makes them very nervous. So um, I will walk around because part of the thing that I want you to get used to is getting uncomfortable. Um, the crooked path is a lot about being uncomfortable. Can you get comfortable being uncomfortable? And so this is just one of the things that I'm going to challenge the people in the back is can they keep up with me? As Sandy said, this is, this is for you. This is about you. So raise your hand, throw something at me, say, hey, Chris, um, I have a question. I have an hour and a half. I have some prepared comments, um, but if you don't ask questions, we're going to do a lot of staring at each other, and that's probably not going to be very good. So let me get my slide clicker here. Part of the crooked path is going to be a little bit about my life in the background, um, how I started, how I moved through life, where I am today, and then some challenges to you. So let's rewind a little bit. This is where I started, the great state of Iowa. How many are from Iowa? What? OK. Well, I grew up in um, a small farming community in Iowa, in southwest Iowa. I did not live on a farm. Um, my parents lived in this small area. That town that I grew up in was called Glenwood, Iowa. It was near Omaha, Nebraska, right on the border. And there were two jobs in that town. There was the Swift packing plant that you could work at, or there was a, a state mental hospital. Not a lot of choices uh, to work at. Um, and so when I was in ninth grade, my mother had the opportunity to move to Des Moines. So we picked up our family and went to Des Moines went to high school in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, typical high school, fine. And I ran cross country and track, and I thought, well, I was going to be, you know, some big star. Well, you know, there's very few of us that really make any money in athletics. So about mm, January of my senior year, um, that is the three months before I graduated, I decided, uh, I guess I need to go to college because nobody's offering me an Olympic scholarship. So I um, quickly filled out an application and went down the street to a small liberal arts school called Central, Central College. Why do you have pictures of Pella windows up there, Chris? Central is located in the town of Pella, Iowa. Now, how many of you have Pella windows in your house? Oh, a few of you, yes. Pella windows. You've probably heard of Pella windows. The other thing that you may have heard about at this particular very small little town are Vermeer farm implements. Round balers? Oh, I'm seeing a little bit more of the heads nod on that. So here's a very small town, great college. I got a biology and chemistry degree there, and I was going to be a veterinarian. By gosh, this is what my job is going to be. This is what I'm going to do. Along the path, though, there's always some changes. One of the changes happened during my junior year, and that school partnered with sister schools around. So one of the faculty members had taken a sabbatical to the University of Hawaii, and that professor at the University of Hawaii came to Central College. 
Now, I'm not sure who got the better, right, better deal. If you're, if you're at Central and you're going to Hawaii, that's pretty good. If you're Hawaii coming to the middle of Iowa, I'm thinking, oh, you chose poorly. But this individual came and he studied fungal diseases of papaya. Not a lot of papaya in the middle of Iowa, but it was really cool because he studied something that uh, I had never heard of. He taught a laboratory class and he gave guest lectures and wow, that's really, that is really fascinating. He had some tools that um, were looking at the fungal growth under the microscope and at the time it was using fluorescence and wow, as an undergraduate I thought this is way cool, way, way cool. So. I had the opportunity to take a summer and go to the University of Hawaii and study. That didn't suck, let me tell you. Leaving from Iowa, that was a pretty good gig. As an undergraduate, your parents are like, are you kidding me, this is part of your education? Yes, mother, it's part of my education. So I had the opportunity to go to the University of Hawaii for about six weeks and study uh, fungal pathology on papaya. I decided at that time maybe vet school really wasn't that cool. Maybe I wanted to do something else. So I came back, scrapped the vet degree. That was probably going to be too hard anyway, and I had to take the, you know, different exams and all sorts of things. And that was a part of my life that I really wasn't very good at being proactive, so I had probably missed the deadline anyway. So I decided to go up the street and go to Iowa State. And I know that there is at least an Iowa State person at the table I'm sitting. So on, on to Iowa State. Iowa State, I got a master's degree in plant pathology, studied fungal diseases of crops, uh, wheat and corn, sunflowers. And then um, was looking around, because some of you may have gone on to graduate school and you're finishing up your degree, and you're thinking, okay, now what do I do? Because I don't have a job, and do I go on to get another degree? What do I do? Well, so I decided, A, I was really sick of Iowa. I mean, I would, I, lot, Iowa is a great place, and I have a new passion for it as I'm older. But when you're younger, and you grow up in the same town, you grow up in the same state, you have the same friends, you kind of go, I need some new friends. And I was a young buck at the time. Um, I was done with Iowa. Somebody in the Iowa State program said, there's, a, there's an investigator that is looking at some gene regulation of plants, and she's got kind of a cool project that you might be interested in. Um, would you be interested in going to study under her. Sure, I would. Where is she? LSU, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ah, that's a culture change from the middle of Iowa. So I'm in my little Chevy Chevette. How many of you had a Chevy Chevette? Oh, we've got some here. That's a quality car. Pack everything on. I'm driving down to Baton Rouge, and I'm going through the back country and I realized, wow, huh, there's some people in Louisiana that are not living very well. Getting their water out of catch basins, poverty level was quite extreme. And so you begin to appreciate what you have in your journey of life once you see what other folks may or may not have. So I went to LSU. And you can look at these dates, and if some of you are quick on math, you can figure out how old I am, but don't tell people that. Um, so I went to LSU, got a PhD in, in biological sciences, molecular biology, using, and we had this plant at the table. Who knows what this plant is? Arabidopsis, yes, yes. Um, the white mouse of the plant world at the time. And one of the things that my investigator had was a grant from NASA, the space, 
NASA. And she had the grant to look at the effects of microgravity on plant growth and development. Wow, that's pretty cool. Because at that time, during the late 80s, mid 90s, we were in the height of space exploration. The space station, the shuttle, long-term space exploration. And yet, if you know anything about going to space, you have to take your own food there. And if you don't, you've got to figure out how to grow your food. If you take the shuttle and you wanted a quarter pound of food on the shuttle, it would cost about $25,000 just to carry that quarter pound hamburger on the shuttle. Well, that doesn't work if you have a long-term space exploration. You're going to be gone for more than a couple of days. So what we were doing is we were looking at how these plants behaved in a microgravity environment. And one of the interesting things is that plants did not go ahead and produce fruit. They just grew vegetatively. And so we were looking at how did these, why did these plants behave like that? What genes were turned on or turned off and things like that were their different growing systems. And so I had the opportunity through my PhD and subsequently through my postdoc at the University of Florida to have two shuttle experiments. Um, we had two experiments go up on the shuttle, shuttles, uh, looking at the effects of microgravity. And I want to tell you a little bit about how you study plants or animals or humans in a microgravity environment. Because unless you actually get up on the shuttle, we have this thing called gravity here on Earth, and it really affects your experiments. But what you can do is you can get on an airplane. And the airplane is a KC-135. Those are big cargo planes that the military uses. They strip the planes down, as you can see here in this picture, and it's all covered in padding and Velcro and duct tape, kind of like an insane asylum inside a plane. And in the back, there are regular airplane seats. And so you go in, and you can duct tape or Velcro your experiments down, and the plane goes through a series of parabolas. So the plane goes up to about 33,000 feet and drops to about 17,000 feet and then starts again. And so you get about a two, two and a half G pull up. And then that 20 to 22 seconds of free fall is microgravity. How many of you have been on a roller coaster or something like that, and you've gone over the edge, and you go, and you start to feel that kind of coming up in your stomach? Well, that's what you feel, except you just continue over that. And one of the things that you'll see in my pocket there, and I grabbed a few of these, when I flew yesterday. Anybody ever used any of these? I hope not. And whatever you do, do not use one in that says, do not place in seat back after use. That's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. But if you see right there in this, I have, I have the industrial version in this pocket here. Those are plastic with that little red tie. So fortunately, knock on wood, I did not get sick. But what the plane does is it leaves Houston, goes over the Gulf. You go out, you do 40 parabolas. Uh, turn around, 40. Turn around, 40. Turn around. <clears throat> you can be on 160 to 200 parabola run. What do you think happens if you get sick after parabola 5? <laughs> it's a bad day for you. It's a real bad day for you. What we do is we give you 
not these little weenie bags. We give you a whole box of white ones with ties. We stick you in the back. We put you in the regular seat. We give you a washcloth and we say, we'll be back to you in about two and a half hours. And you're going to two and a half hours dry heave 195 times. It's a great day. It's a great day. But the, the beauty is they use this plane to train astronauts. You can take experiments. It's, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but this is a um, shot during a microgravity um, run. I don't know if I have a pointer here. No. So I'm hanging onto this bar, and then back in the back are my sleeves from my flight suit that are floating, and, and I'm actually floating. So I'm holding on so that I don't float up um, and doing some experiments. But the best part is that when you're done with your experiments, you can lock everything down, and then you can go to a part of the plane where you don't have as many bars and things that you'll get hurt. And you can do, you can sit on the ceiling and you do somersaults. And if for people that get sick, you can kind of be upside down. You need to talk to them, and they get really pissed at you because they're, they're heaving in the bag, and they're looking at you upside down, and they're not very happy. Um, and so this was a great opportunity. This was my life. Oh my gosh, this was great. I hung with the scientists. I hung with the astronauts. I spent nine months at the Kennedy Space Center. I met my husband there, but he wasn't one of the great. No, he was good. St um, <laughs> still, uh, still same husband. I still have, I still have him even after 22 plus years. Um, but we were all together. It was the club. We spoke the language. We were rocking. Um, but how many of you knew that NASA had a program on plant space biology? A few, a few. But nobody ever said it. We didn't tell anybody. NASA didn't tell anybody. We spoke to ourselves. Our communication outside the four walls of the space biology, Kennedy, nobody knew. And so think about what has happened, the communication and the understanding. The program is gone. We have no shuttle program anymore. We have very little space biology anymore. And so this part of my life was a very difficult for me in the sense of I had some mentors that said, this path will come to an end. What? No. La, 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 la. They said, no. Even though you and your PI and the folks in your lab are doing very well on grants. I'd lived off of soft money for a while on here. You're doing very well, but we see that it's not sustainable. Are you willing to take a different path? Are you willing to go somewhere else where it's not comfortable for you? Woo wee that was tough. That was a big jump off of a high board. That was a jump from not only a crooked path, but I had to make a right turn. So what did I do? Well, I had met my husband, and I had decided, oh, you know, I could hang in science, but I was really tired of living off soft money. I mean, I know a lot of you live off soft money now. It's tough. It's hard work. You have to grovel to federal agencies to get paid. And as you get older in life, you think, wowie, that's, I'm not sure about that. So I sat down, and I talked to some folks and some mentors, and I talked to my husband, and I said, you know, I could go back to school. I could go back and get my veterinarian degree that I thought that I was going to do many, many years ago. I could hang and do grants and do something else. And somebody said, well, why don't you go to law school? Huh. Wow, don't know about that, never thought about that. 
And they said, that might be something. You can marry the science that is a passion, and you can marry the legal aspect. OK, yeah, I can do that. I can think about that. So if you're going to go to med school or law school or whatnot, you have to take the LSAT or the MCAT or the VCAT or some CAT. I don't know what it is now today. But you apply, and then you wait. And then you go, usually about nine months later or so, um, because you start in the fall semester. This is a part of my life here that I would not recommend doing simultaneously. That is, I was accepted into law school. Sweet, great, yeah. And about a month later, I realized I was pregnant. And yes, I know how that happened. But that was not what I was anticipating. And I thought, oh my goodness gracious. I know I can defer one, but I cannot defer the other. And so we moved from Florida to Arkansas. And I had already one child. And this is a really old picture. Look at how, how calm we look. This is, not, this is not reality. This picture over here is reality. So we moved to Arkansas. I had a one-year-old, and I was away pregnant. And then I had a husband that was a brand new faculty member, tenure track. Talk about crazy crap. I know some of you are thinking about being faculty or are faculty. Those first three years as your faculty member, it sucks for your spouse. It sucks for your family. You're writing grants. You're teaching. You're doing all sorts of crap. So I love him dearly. We were not very good friends during this time. But so I show up, and I think, OK. I go into the career office at the law school before it starts in, I guess it was June. And the dean of students was there. And I show up and I say, hi, I'm Chris Darty." He goes, oh, you're pregnant. Really? How'd you guess, you know? <laughs> so I said, um, what do you recommend that I do? Should I defer? Um, and he said, well, here's what I can do for you. When you go to law school, the first year as the 1Ls, that's what they're called, Everybody takes the same class. He said, I will take one of the classes away from you. You'll have to double up your second year. But that will cut you down from, I think it was 15 hours to 11 hours. OK. It allowed me to um, take a little bit of time. He said, are you willing to try that? Uh, yeah, OK, let, let's, let's try to do that. I'm, I'm kind of stuck right now. I'm thinking, you know, if I don't go to law school, I don't really have a job, and I don't know what to do. So I said, OK, I will do that. So I went to law school. I showed up August 10th, 11th, whenever it was. And Aaron, my second son, was born August 10th. 28th. And thank whatever deity you choose, he was born over at the, this is too funny actually, he was born over Labor Day weekend. Imagine that. And so I had an extra day. I showed up back to class. Again, don't go down this path. This is not good for anybody. I showed up back to class on the Tuesday. You should have seen the look on those kids' face when I showed up. They're thinking, wow. And you should have seen the look on the professor's face, because the rest of the students in my class, they got no, no excuse. Because the professor would be like, uh-uh, your assignment's due? This woman just had a baby. You're out. You're out. <laughs> I did not have a lot of friends at law school at the time. But what I did learn during this path was a couple things. One, there are folks along your journey 
that will help you in ways you don't really appreciate until later on in life. One, the dean of the law school. Two, be able to change up that class. That was, that was major. The other one that I didn't truly appreciate until later on was Ralph and I thought, okay, we've got this. I've got my class schedule here. He's got his class schedule and teaching here. We're, uh, the law school's on campus on this side. He's over on this side. I can get on my bike and come over, and Ralph can watch Aaron for the first six weeks of life in the morning, and then I'll take him in the afternoon. You can get children into daycare after their six weeks, but Department of Health and Human Services really don't like you to leave children six weeks or younger in a closet for a while. So, so we, had, we had to work this out. We were, we were so bad. We're like, yeah, we're rocking, we're rocking. I get my schedule, he gets his class, and we're mashing up, and we have 10 minutes that overlap. Oh, crap. Uh, I can't really leave class early. I guess I could. Ralph is the new faculty professor. Probably doesn't want to show up 10 minutes later. He would have no students. So we're like, oh, we're screwed. We're screwed. What are we going to do? And we were just kind of, we were there in his office kind of moping around, trying to think what we were going to do. And we didn't have any family. Ralph's parents had both um, died many, many years ago. My mother lived in Seattle, Washington, and was still working. My sister lived in Iowa working, um, and so we didn't have anybody. In walks this person um, who worked in the biology department. She was an older lady, uh, and it, just, a, just a gem. And she said, well, how you doing? You know, how's the kids? Blah, blah, blah. And we're like, uh, we're, we got 10 minutes. We got 10, 10 minutes seems like not very long, but when you have a 10 minute ordeal like that, that's an eternity. So we're kind of, we got 10 minutes. So what are we going to do? And she said, well, she said, I can take my lunch break at that time. And that way I'll watch Aaron for you while Ralph goes to class, and Chris, you'll come over there. That's no big deal. Just bring him down, and then I'll go down to one of the conference rooms, or I'll sit down in the hallway. What? Here's this woman who had, she didn't have to do that. She did it out of the kindness of her heart. That 10 minutes, that 10 minutes was the... 10 minutes that allowed us to do that. Um, and she was, ugh, it makes me sad thinking about her. Um, sad in the sense of, I miss her, it was really, it was a great individual. She allowed us to, to go down this path. And so those people in your life, you don't realize what they will do for you until you get into a situation like that. And that individual was able for what allowed us to continue on the path. So pay attention to the people that may say, I will help you. If they're offering those services to you, they want to out of the kindness of your heart. Sometimes take them up on it. You will be surprised that the very little things that you will do, they will do for you, will make a major, major change. Likewise, I've got this book up here. After the first year when I went back to um, not drinking out of the coffee pot and um, having not quite so many dark circles under my eyes and beginning to enjoy my husband again, I spent a fair amount of time in the library at the law school. And I'd have students come up and say, why are you here in the library? I see you all the time here. And I said to them, this is my job. 
this is my job because I have to be here from 8 to 5. Even though I'm out of class at 11, I need to get my work, my homework done because when I leave at 5 o'clock, I got another job. And as the school year progressed, I noticed more and more students sitting in the tables because my little comment of treat it like a job, this is your job, even though you may not have family at home, you can do other things. Maybe you want to exercise, maybe you have friends, maybe you want to play video games, but you then have got your stuff done. It seems simple to us today, but when you're in your early 20s, it's not that simple. So I, unbeknownst to me until many, many years later, was a mentor to folks getting them on the correct path of life. So this was great. This was a great time in my life and I enjoyed it. But as you will see, and I'm sure some of you already have experienced, you don't just continue on the same path throughout your life starting at point A, going to point B, and never deviate. You act like a bumblebee, and you go here and turn layer, and one step back, and two step forward, and all those things. So I'd been in academics all my life. If I wasn't as a graduate student, a researcher, doing grants, postdoc, then going back to school, I was in the ivory tower. I knew college campuses like the back of my hand, best places to go get your coffee, the union, this, that, and the other. Well, once I graduated from law school, yeah, I had to get a job. And so I fortunately got a job at a law firm uh, there in the state of Arkansas doing intellectual property, a picture of a patent. So I combined my science and the legal profession and a patent attorney. So I helped universities and med schools and whatnot on their intellectual property, patents and trademarks and science-based things and research agreements and all that kinds of things. And one day when I was sitting in my office, the receptionist called and said, there is somebody on the phone from some chicken company and his name is Dr. John Hardiman. For those of you who are in poultry science, John Hardiman is probably the grandfather of poultry genetics. And so he calls, and I pick up the phone, and he says, hi, my name's John Hardiman. I'm looking for a patent attorney because ours had just died. OK, great. That's a great way to get business, whatever works, you know. So I visited with him. and found out that Cobb, Cobb Ventress, is the poultry genetics company. It is probably the number one or two, depending on who you talk to in the world, for poultry genetics. And it's just down the street in a small little town called Siloam Springs, Arkansas. OK, great. So I do some work with Dr. Hardiman and this, that, and the other. And during this time in Arkansas, my boys are growing up, and they're playing sports. And my youngest is playing little soccer, little league soccer. And for those that either have kids or nieces and nephews, when you have the little, little kid soccer, if you've ever not seen that, go out to a field someday on Saturday. It is a hoot. Here's all these little kids, and they're chasing this ball, and they're just like a scrum, and they just run around, they chase the ball. And then you also have some kids that don't have want anything to do with soccer, and they're over there, and they're picking the grass and things like that. So, so my son was um, playing soccer, and there's other parents standing along. We're all clapping and cheering and whatnot. And there's an individual that's standing next to me, and we introduce ourselves, and he says, hi, my name is Les Ballage. Oh, hi, Les. My name's Chris Darty. Hi, Chris. Who's your son? Eh, my son's over there. Who's your son? Eh, my, my son, he says, 
my son's over there picking the grass. I'm like, okay, sorry, you know. Um, we disperse. Next week, we show up. Hey, Chris. Hi, Les. Chris, what do you do? I work for Wright, Lindsay, and Jennings. I'm a patent attorney. Oh, Les, what do you do? I'm the general counsel at Tyson Foods. Oh, nice to meet you, Les. Eh, see you next week. Week. Chris, what do you do? Les. So by the end of the soccer season, Les had found out that I had a PhD, scientist, patent attorney. I had found out Les was general counsel at Tyson Foods. Tyson had recently purchased IBP, which was a big beef pork industry. They had no one on their legal department that had any science whatsoever. They had a patent portfolio of over 90 patents, research agreements, food safety, animal well-being, environmental, all that kind of stuff. And by the end of the soccer season, he asked me to come in-house and work for Tyson Foods. The lesson on your path for that is engage with the people that are around you. You don't have to talk to the person sitting next to you on the airline, but you do have to engage with your colleagues and people you don't know. Communication is a critical skill. Can you talk to the person next to you? From there, Tyson, I've been there since, since 2003. Oh, that's the number of years for the same company. Fortunately, I've had a lot of opportunities. Started out in the legal department. Started out um, doing things that the rest of the lawyers didn't want to do. You know, words that started with the letter P. They didn't ever like those kind of words. Words that had three consonants in a row. That, send that to Chris. I don't know what that says. Um, and so I was a lawyer. But I was kind of defined as a science lawyer. So then I had an opportunity to move forward and do some intellectual property. And then today, I, as you heard, I head up our sustainable food production. That is a new initiative of Tyson Foods where we're combining different areas, animal well-being, sustainability, and innovation. And so this is a new journey that I'm undertaking. It's a lot of fun. It's a steep learning curve. But one of the things along the crooked path is I had the opportunity to make a right turn, to make a left turn, to go in a direction that I was not comfortable with at times. I had mentors and other folks that said, you can do it. Don't be afraid. Can you go forward in ways that you, frankly, don't even know you can do? If some would have asked me when I was an undergraduate, would I have ever gone to law school? I would have said, what have you been drinking? That, no, I knew there are no lawyers in my family. I didn't know any lawyers. The only lawyers I knew were on the back of a phone book or advertised on TV, and that was, bleh, I wouldn't do that. So think about jumping off the high board. Also, don't let others define you. You have your own personal brand and you need to communicate that. If I had been defined by just the scientist or just the lawyer, then I may not have had the opportunities. Likewise for you, communication. Be brave and define your brand. How do you present yourself in the room? Do you sit at the table? When you go into a big meeting, and there's a table, and there's chairs along the wall, where do you sit? That 
communication, nonverbal, sends a powerful message. So you should sit at the table. You can sit at the table. You don't have to ask for permission to sit at the table. And don't let others define you. Make sure you are defining your personal brand in the way you want to be defined. Communication is something that as scientists, whether you're in ag or life science or any other science, we, we suck at it. We don't do very good communicating our science. And social communication is even harder for many of us. So think about this. Recently on Twitter, that's been picked up by BuzzFeed. Okay, how many of you know what BuzzFeed is? Oh, good. That's good, good, good. We have some hands that didn't go down. Your homework today is to figure out what BuzzFeed is. So BuzzFeed picked up on some Twitter quotes where individuals, and you probably know who this individual is, had their bio in a very short statement written for the male. And then this author wrote that same bio if it had been a female scientist. No one could imagine that behind Newton's large brain and frail appearance hid one of the most prodigious brains in the world. Isn't that lovely? Hmm, yeah. And how about this one? Best known for his work as a naturalist, developing a theory of evolution to explain biological change. Okay. As a devout husband and father, Darwin balanced his family duties with the study of the specimens he brought from his travels. Wow. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's gender specific, but somebody else has defined them and defined them in ways that, you know, in one hand, it's not too bad. Look at the words that are being used. They're usually two syllables or one syllable. Look at the words down here. As scientists, we talk to ourselves in our own language. We love speaking within our four walls, but how many people outside those four walls understand us? Because we're in our club. We're talking amongst ourselves. Our communication outside the four walls is not very good in today's society. Twitter, tweets, can you explain to somebody what you do in 140 characters? If you cannot, I challenge you that you are not communicating. Molecular biology, gene regulation, transcription factors, huh? Do you have a 30 second elevator speech? How do you get there? How do you get your communication, your brand? How as agriculture or scientists can we move forward? Because right now, today, the people out there, consumer, our peers, they don't trust us. They don't understand us. Why? because we have talked amongst ourselves for these many, many years. We're comfortable in our club. We like to use the language that we know how to speak to each other with because we are not necessarily very good at talking or listening to others that are not part of our circle of friends. And so we need to do some things that will make some of us quite uncomfortable. We need to listen to other that don't agree with us. So use what nature has given us. Two eyes. Look and see. What path are you on and what path 
is over there? Are there individuals on a path that you have failed to see? Two ears. Listen to others that are not like you. Understand their fears and concerns. I deal this with this all the time in animal welfare issues. And then finally, speak to others that have not heard from us. Use them in proportion. You got two, you got two, you got one. Use the one after you have done the other two. Why are we struggling? Consumers, people, food production. People out there today know more about music. His history? That's sad. That's really sad that more people know about history than where their food comes from. And so, again, I challenge you on your career, on your life, on your path, you need to communicate because folks today, they don't know where their food comes from or where it's made. And we're not that far above sports. And if we had certain folks in the room, we would be below sports. So, 2% of the population are farmers. Two. Fifteen percent produce, process, and sell the nation's food. Three and counting generations from the farm. People don't know what we do. They're confused. They're scared. They don't understand the technology used. They have no idea about modern agriculture today or modern science. They hear words, genetically modified organisms, gene expression, new technology. Ah, those are scary words because we, we in science and ag have failed to communicate outside of our circle of friends. Perception is reality. The perception today 53% corporate-owned factory farms. Factory, what is a factory farm? I don't even know what a factory farm is. Is a factory farm large number of animals? Is a factory farm a family that owns a large number of acres? I don't know. 30% say they're from mid-sized corporate forms, farms. And then only 17 family-run farms. That's perception. Reality, 91% of the farms today, those individuals have less than 250,000 in annual sales. That's a family-run farm. But yet, that is not what individuals outside of our four walls think. They think it's all big conglomerate factory farms. Social media, as I said, BuzzFeed, Twitter, tweets, Snapchat, Instagram, you name it, Facebook. This, my friends, on your crooked path needs to be addressed. Whether the message is partially true, true, completely false, it does not matter because one individual will tweet and then the other one picks it up. And because we have not done a very good job of communicating outside of our walls, the consumer, your friends, they don't know what to think. They're three generations removed from the farm. They probably don't know a farmer, maybe around here, but clearly not in bigger cities. And so they will assume this is correct because, again, we aren't listening to their concerns and we're not having a dialogue with those individuals that probably make us uncomfortable. Meat industry, Tyson Foods, big miss a couple years ago. 
pink slime, lean, fine textured beef. That was a train that nobody saw coming. That product had been in the meat industry for years. And yet through TV, social media, incorrect photographs, people tweeting stuff that wasn't accurate, huge, huge economic issues. What happened? Number of plants closed. People lost their job, millions of dollars lost. Why did this occur? Communication. People afraid to be truthful and transparent and communicate. Because we were fearful, what if they don't understand? What if they don't like it? What happens if that they are afraid? Then we need to do a better job of communicating. Can you leave the path you're on today, even though it may not be a path you're leaving from a professional aspect? Can you talk to people that you are uncomfortable talking to because they don't know your language? Can you speak in 140 characters or less? Here's how you do it. Shared values are three times more likely to build that relationship than any of your technical, scientific, or brain smarts. If the individual connects with you in some way, that individual will trust you. Consumers, we use the word consumers in my business, consumers are more likely to trust a science mom, and science mom doesn't mean you have to have kids, a science female than any other folks. Farmers are right there. You, even the men back there, that you are scientists. You need to convey. They have a value. You have things in your life, whether that's where you take your kids to daycare, where you shop, they connect with you, so speak to them in that value system. If you don't speak to them and you don't connect with them, we as an industry and you as an individual can ruin a personal brand or a brand in five minutes. As Warren Buffett says, 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes to ruin it. Think about the examples that I've shown. Lean, fine textured beef, food ink, GMOs. Science is fine, but yet we're not communicating that. And if we don't communicate it, somebody else will, and then we're behind the eight ball. Trust. Transparency and communication. If you do these things, you can move along the path. You will get comfortable being uncomfortable. And we will be able to get folks that understand what we do today. And we won't have folks looking in and go, wow, I don't know what they're doing and it's really scary and I don't trust them. So my challenge to you today can you do the simple things? Can you speak to somebody about something that you know about and make it in a language that's simple? I like to tell the story. I play old lady tennis. That's uh, doubles tennis with old ladies. And so my, my tennis team, um, I'm the only scientist there. And yet I think I have some of the smartest old lady tennis players in Northwest Arkansas. Why? Because every time that we get together, I take the opportunity to engage in a conversation with them. Example, we were talking the other day and somebody said, 
well, I just can't believe those chicken breasts are so big. You guys just mu must put hormones and steroids in those chickens all the time. Huh? No. So I said, not true. I said, here's what I want you to do. I said, one, it's against the law to add hormones and steroids to poultry. Federal regulations prohibit it. It's against the law. I said, so, I said, Beth, who is going off about big chicken breasts. I said, Beth, go into the grocery store. I said, pick up any package of chicken. Hopefully it's Tyson, but you don't have to buy that. Pick up any package of chicken. I said, look on the label, and somewhere you're going to see, it might be on the front or the back, there's going to be a little asterisk. It'll say, federal regulations prohibit added hormones and steroids. It's against the law. I said, you, Beth, you go do it. Go, go see. She came back next week. Wow, you're right, Chris. I never knew that. I'm going to tell some other folks. I'm going to tell the people that I have the book club with. It was simple. It was easy to understand. I took the opportunity to help educate her. You can take the opportunity to help educate. We're all plenty Spartan here. But can you communicate? in a trustworthy manner, in a simple, easy-to-understand manner. If you can, then we will have this slide versus the other, where every individual is then tweeting or Snapchatting or Facebooking or communicating out accurate, understandable information and that we as scientists, and especially in agriculture, can really begin to get people on to our path. Because we have taken the opportunity to go to their path for a while. Don't expect them just to come over, because they should. You have to take the initiative. You have to go off of the path. Take that path that is not easy, it's difficult, and sometimes way uncomfortable. But if you do, you will be able to do the things that will move forward in your own life. What would you do if you weren't afraid? Would you do a different career? Would you do a class? Would you speak to somebody that you've never spoken to? Would you do some volunteer work? How do you get out of your path? How do you get out of your comfort zone? Remember, your path is narrow, and it might be crooked. But get engaged, and you will reap the benefits of it. Thank you. I think we have, do we have time for questions? Oh, we have time for questions. Nobody asked me questions in between here. I want to thank um, Chris for an incredible presentation. Well, thank you. Just really great. Um, what I'd like to ask, are there any questions that have come in from Worcester, Kathy? Um, Worcester, um, please feel free to chat in your questions. Um, We'll answer them, and so I'd like to open it up for questions. And I'll let Chris and handle I'll, it and from I'll, here. And, and I'll repeat the question, so. Yes. So let me repeat the question for our friends um, in cyberspace. So the question is, um, science has a lot of precision. Um, it is technical. 
And so when you try to communicate in simple ways, you may lose some of that precision or that technical aspect um, or the depth. And that scientists are uncomfortable because, frankly, we like to get in the weeds. And they, we think everybody should get in the weeds with us. And so it's, it's a challenge. But I think you have to balance the ability to communicate out to folks that, frankly, they, they may not want to get in the weeds or they can't get into the weeds. And if you communicate in something that's so high up here, you will lose them. So I, I would say, and what we try to do, is take some of that and you will lose precision and you will lose some of the technical aspect, but you're going to get folks to come over and look. You may then find individuals that say, oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. Do you have more information? Oh, that's your door. You can flood them then with all sorts of things. But you got to have the hook. If you start going into all of the pros and cons and how we made, you know, Roundup Ready soybeans, no. We need to understand why folks may or may not agree with that technology. And there's the value judgment. Most of the time when they ask for communication, they don't want to necessarily know about the science. They're looking for a value. Do you agree? Support? Don't agree? How does it affect me? I would, sacrifice isn't the right word, but I would lean more toward simple, realizing you're going to give up some technical stuff, but you need to reach the masses, because if you don't, the simple will reach the masses. That's a great question. Yes. Perfect. Question from Worcester is, how do you overcome the risk of losing your reputation in five minutes by speaking out to those you don't know? Oh, it's a great question. You, um, here's what you do. Instead of speaking out to those that you don't know, what was the thing I told you to do first? Listen. Listen. It's amazing. If you listen to the people that you don't know or the people that um, may be adversarial or the people that you may not agree with, the guard goes down. I don't like how you treat animals. I don't like GMOs. I don't like that you're wearing a pink jacket today, Chris. Okay, what is it about the pink jacket that you don't like? Oh, I, 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 you should have wore blue today. Okay, oh, but that's fair. I, I didn't have a blue jacket, you know. What is it about the, you know, way you treat animals that you don't like? Well, you know, those birds should, you know, be given music and they should be able to go outside and whatnot. Okay, well, did you think about sometimes if the birds go outside that it's snowy and they might get cold, and so we want to keep them in a nice warm barn? Oh, so, the, so here's the lawyer trick. You can all say that, you know, you've been and slept at a Holiday Inn and you're a lawyer for the day. Instead of talking, if someone comes at you from an adversarial aspect, flip it on them. Ask them a question. Don't respond to their statement. Ask them a question. So that is the way, my friend at Wooster, that you will save your reputation by listening first, asking questions, only after that inserting your opinion. It's amazing how that works. That's a great question. Yes. Ah, that, 
Oh, you got it. So the question is, why did I go back to law school to get a patent attorney versus a patent agent? And some of you may be uh, thinking, you can go and be a patent agent without going to law school. Um, great, great choice. Uh, that was just, um, there was a law school at the, at the U of A, um, and uh, it was just a personal choice for me, but I do know other folks that have um, undergraduate, master's, PhD, and then they sit for the exam, and then you can be a, a patent agent. It's a great career opportunity as well. So mine was just a personal choice. Yeah. So the question is, if you're a patent agent, you can't do some things like a regular lawyer, like argue in court or, um, you know, litigate in, in some areas. And so you can, you can still do a lot of the, uh, the different things. It's really just, um, you know, what do you think you want to do? Law firms and companies will hire both. Um, and, and so I really haven't litigated that much in, in the courtroom. And so at the end of the day, could I have gone either way? Yeah, I just chose that one. So that's a great question. Yes. So I have a question. You have a dual career and you're still in law and you're still in the department. Yeah, so the question is, I had the science and the legal um, dual careers, and did I face any gender inequalities in either? Both. Um, and so the one, the one slide I had up there that said, don't let others define you, with the, you know, kind of the picture of the woman in the shopping bags, um, and that it's a challenge. It's a challenge then, it's still a challenge today. And so I don't believe it really matters what career it is. You will always have folks that um, may have preconceived notions and you just have to work through those. It's, it's not easy. I can't sit up there and say, oh, the world is full of roses and it's gonna be perfect. No, you're gonna have to work um, harder you're going to have to spend some longer nights, and um, you're going to have to be on your game. And you have a greater opportunity of stubbing your toe, unfortunately, than a, uh, a male in the same position. So, and we had a Worcester question, and then I'll get you that one. This question from Worcester is kind of um, industry specific. Okay. It says, with the pink slime issue in mind, how is Tyson being proactive about animal welfare and innovative technologies that may not even be currently considered as dangerous by consumers? Oh, that's an interesting question. So what we are doing um, is we are trying to be much more transparent. And so uh, one of the things that you'll see coming out, we put out what we call a sustainability report every year. And we will be disclosing things in there. Again, it, it's factual. Because we want to make sure that folks know what we're doing. And, and a great example is we made a commitment to uh, reduce the use of uh, human antibiotics in our broiler production chain by 2017. And we made the commitment, we will report. So we now, you'll see in March, where we are today, how we're reducing, um, what, what we're trying to do for innovation. We want to make sure that the animal is not suffering, and so if that animal needs antibiotics and needs to be treated, and our veterinarian says we need to treat, we will treat, but we will disclose. So the whole concept of we may not necessarily have everybody in our camp, but we've made the decision for increased communication, increased transparency. That's a great question. There's a question over here. Yes, yeah, so the question is, how do you communicate your own personal brand? This is a very, very 
big thing everyone needs to work on. Um, I didn't truly appreciate it until I had a, a coach um, that had come in and, and it, everything from just some basic, you know, hygiene and how you do some things. Um, and she's still working on some of this, but, um, but just how you bring yourself into a room. And so you guys didn't see me earlier, but before I come into a room or a meeting or whatnot, I'll go into a bathroom. I'll find myself a quiet place. Three big deep breaths out. Sounds kind of yoga. You know, because what you need to do does a couple things. One, amazing that oxygen will come in. It has a calming effect. Two, it forces you to bring your shoulders back. And even for guys, I don't care. You, it forces you to bring your shoulders back. So you walk into a room and you are not here you are upright. And I'm telling you, presence of coming into a room is very powerful. Personal brand of how are you when you are not on show? Oh, that's the critical one. Do you treat folks the same when you're not in that meeting or the business entity or business room? Do you say, hi, how are you today? And that you are honest because if you're one way here and you're one way here, oh, darling, that will come back to bite you in the booty quicker than anything else. So personal brand, lots of things out there on the web. I'm sure the university has some folks that can help on things. Uh, but spend some time thinking about your personal brand. It's very important. We got a Worcester question. Yeah, I'm trying to be cognizant of the time, but one last Worcester question, and then we do have um, Dean Hendrick here to speak, so I want to yep. kind of keep us on schedule. Um, so the question is, what advice would you give to someone with a biology background who would or is considering a patent law program but doesn't have the opportunity to attend school full time? Would a patent agent program be a better time benefit trade? Yeah. So. Um, the patent agent program is clearly an opportunity for folks with a biology or science uh, degree in order to sit for um, the patent exam. Uh, you have to have some undergraduate degree in the hard sciences. It could be biology, chemistry, engineer, engineering, things like that. And that is uh, an opportunity that you can't practice the law, but you can draft patent applications get in with law firms, companies. I think there's programs online that you might be able to look at, and it is, it is a shorter, um, won't cost you as much money, uh, doesn't offer quite the same things, but it is a very viable program that I'd encourage you to look into. And with that, I think I have to step down. I appreciate uh, the sponsors for bringing me in. I will be here for the rest of the day, so thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for taking your time and sharing with us. And now we are um, fortunate to have Dean Hendrick here, who has a few words to share with us. And then we will have a break. Um, of course, as usual, take care of yourselves. Um, and then we will have a wonderful panel discussion. Dean Hendrick. I'll uh, stand up here so I don't have to awkwardly hold the mic. Um, it won't take me half an hour. I don't have the uh, gift for protracted oratory or maybe much gift for oratory at all, but I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you this morning. Um, the uh, planning for the symposium uh, and really for the gender initiative itself predates me and my role as acting dean for the college. So, and I'll remarks make sure that I give credit to our, our current uh, interim provost uh, and former dean, Bruce McFerrin. But thanks, first of all, Christine, uh, for a really great talk this morning. Appreciate that. Sandy, your efforts uh, for, for not just leading the initiative, but organizing the symposium. And Kathy, to you and uh, uh, your office as well for uh, providing leadership here. 
This is the first of what I hope will become an annual event and just one of many components of the college's gender initiative. Um, one of the handful of things um, that the college is undertaking uh, is the gender initiative and, and the symposium in order to make the college a more equitable and inclusive environment. And one that doesn't just reflect better the demographic makeup of the citizens of our state or the stakeholders we serve, but, um, or the populations from which we draw our faculty, staff, and students, but one that also fosters professional development um, of traditionally underrepresented populations in the college, one that changes the culture of the college, and then one that changes leadership in the college, the composition of leadership, and then how we go about our jobs as leaders. Um, since we initiated some of these efforts under Bruce's leadership a couple years ago, I've been very encouraged by the broad-based support that we've had. Um, very strong buy-in and participation from our faculty, uh, from the staff, uh, many of our students, and then also college leaders at all levels. Um, <clears throat> as I think about the college and changes we've made, things that we're doing differently, um, you know, I've been part of organizations that have attempted or done some of these things previously. Um, something I think seems different, at least in our college this time around, and not just I, but others have remarked upon that as well. Um, if you look at us a couple of years ago, by a lot of measures, at least relative to peers, the college is doing pretty well in terms of our uh, gender and racial makeup. Um, it's not to say that those are great numbers, um, just that we weren't remarkably different or remarkably um, uh, doing less well than, than many of our peers, but <clears throat> not doing less well than our peers is not leadership. And so that's um, why we've undertaken a lot of efforts um, to really kind of make over the college in terms of how we think about equity and inclusion. So I think it's important to ask kind of what's changed in the college and how are we doing things as leadership team and faculty, staff, and students differently. And as I was thinking about this, I think at its core, it's really the college has made a switch from tactics to strategy. And so what I mean by that, first of all, relates to the leadership in the college. And tactics are, of course, things employed more by, by frontline troops. Um, and good tactics are, are essential to any successful undertaking. And that includes um, things around equity and, in, and inclusion, um, around diversity. But good tactics are useless without sound strategy, and strategy really, in most organizations, emanates from the upper levels and then diffuses throughout. And so I think this stretch, switch from tactics where we go around fixing things to strategy where we go around creating things in the college um, really, again, can be traced back to commitment from Bruce McFerrin, um, and not just Bruce, but other deans here at The Ohio State University, and their participation in leadership development exercises around diversity and inclusion um, with the encouragement and support of senior administration at the university, um, and the, then the, from there have spread to other administrative uh, layers in the college, to myself when I was senior associate dean and my colleagues at, at other colleges. Um, notably, the efforts begin um, with white men in senior leadership positions. Um, the White Men as Full Diversity Partners Retreat um, is one of the activities that I and others have participated in, really um, uh, kind of fundamental change type experiences that, that we've gone through. And Bruce, um, again, take, took the lead in our college in doing that. Um, one of the outcomes of that and some other things we've been doing is to articulate some goals for the college, things around hiring, around culture, um, other activities, uh, and then discussions that really diffuse themselves throughout college leadership, um, staff leaders included, faculty thought leaders, um, and began the process over the past year or so of operationalizing things. And so that included search committees, so how we populate search committees, the charges that we give to search committees, expectations for search committees very early in the hiring process, um, how we write position descriptions, how we use words around required and desired and preferred to ensure that we're not artificially limiting diverse populations of applicants and therefore candidates um, that we can bring to campus. 
uh, thinking differently about the leadership and organizational structure within the college. So creating a senior office of equity inclusion led by, by Kathy Leckman. Um, setting hiring goals. Bruce set a hiring goal after consulting with the college leadership of hiring 50% of our faculty, um, uh, in new faculty from members of traditionally underrepresented populations and having those discussions now about what that means for staff hires. So articulating these expectations and priorities from leadership, um, again, I'll, I'll go back one example in our job announcements, you know, requesting that applicants document their interests and experience in working with members of underrepresented populations, at least anecdotally seems to have had a positive impact on our applicant pool. We've heard from, from applicants, people we've hired in a couple cases that, that that's been the case. I think another important aspect to this is I read through um, all the many uh, dossiers that, that we get for the hires we're doing. Um, you know, it's also provided a bit of a safety net, I think, for male applicants to share some of their stories. And sharing your efforts and experience around equity and inclusion and, and working with women and minorities um, are not things as white males that are sort of cultural norms for us and things we might not otherwise express. And so when I read through those sections of applications, there are some uh, applicants, um, irrespective of gender or race who just sort of put something in there to have a little bit of filler. But there's a lot of really compelling stories that come out of those as well. And so in an organization like ours, where um, hiring 50% of our, our faculty as women or minorities uh, means that we're still hiring somewhere around 50% white men. And so if we want white men to be allies and advocates for the things that we're trying to do and the changes we're trying to make, then it's helpful that even if a search doesn't yield a candidate, a racial minority, a add to the female faculty, that we're at least able to understand uh, who we're hiring from the white male pool. And again, people who are gonna be true advocates and allies for what we're trying to accomplish. I think another strategic thing has been, um, uh, rather than try and correct inequities and, and exclusivity when we've had it in the college is to avoid that in the first place. Um, one of the things we've done is just changing the norm for faculty appointments, irrespective of funding, from 12 months to nine months. And when we hired faculty at 12 month <coughs> contracts uh, based on appointment type, at the same level we were hiring people, same salary for nine months, we created inequities right from the start. And if you look across our organization, there are some inequities um, that can be traced <coughs> to discipline and some of those further concentrated uh, with our female colleagues simply by, by hiring practices. And so changing <coughs> those practices uh, has been exceedingly helpful. And we've gone back and, and made corrections um, to try and fix those inequities, but again, not creating them in the first place, um, I think is critically important. Minimizing disciplinary differences in salary. And there are certain disciplines in the college in which women in particular are better represented than men. Um, there is no question that when we compete in markets that there will be differences in the starting salaries of faculty, but minimizing and eliminating those across departments and disciplines to the extent that we can again, helps us create an environment that from the start does not have inequities uh, and some exclusivity that's built in. Um, I know there's gonna be discussion about negotiations today, so one of the things to impress upon the people doing hiring in the college is that in our efforts to be good stewards of fiscal resources, which in a very business-like sense means hiring the best possible talent and keeping them here for the least possible amount of money, um, that in our efforts to be good stewards, that we don't also create inequities that might be based on differences in negotiating skills and negotiating tactics, for example. Um, similarly, trying to focus on pre-offer retentions for female or minority faculty, not waiting till they have an offer from somewhere else, but identifying potential risk and in inequities, again, not creating them from the start, but where they've developed for whatever reason over time, um, doing things proactively um, in order to re retain those folks uh, here within the college. So as I think about what's next, I think we've made uh, some good progress. We need to be careful not to congratulate ourselves 
too much. Certainly the demographic changes that we've seen in the college over the last couple of years, starting with faculty and now beginning to think and work more around staff for an important first step, but changing culture and sort of the face and composition of leadership um, uh, is going to be our ultimate goal. It's important to build some added momentum into the things that we've accomplished so far. Um, I think one thing we need to think about with our faculty hires is, you know, having a, um, a hiring focus around creating an equitable and inclusive environment needs to be uh, followed up by creating an evaluative and reward structure for those faculty that's consistent with that. So, for example, if our interest um, is in hiring faculty uh, with an experience in working with members of underrepresented groups, then the standards and criteria for promotion and tenure in academic departments also need to reflect that. It's not just enough to hire, but we need to put in a culture of evaluation and reward that's consistent with that. And if we don't, uh, we'll stagnate, and then our hiring efforts will become, uh, I think, rather hollow, and they're not going to have the, the long-term effects that we desire. Um, I think a further commitment to infuse um, the environment here in the college um, uh, is one that is equitable and inclusive and a priority for us to create, even where we do have some of those corrective actions to take is very important as well. So in closing, I want to thank all of you um, who have spoken uh, or organized or speak um, and participate throughout the day. Um, thank you for supporting the symposium. Thanks for all the great work that you're doing on behalf of the college. Um, we're running a few minutes early, and um, what I was wondering is if there are any questions for Dr. Hendrick um, before he disappears um, about the college or any of the, of the programs. I don't know if um, where Kathy's at, if she's manning the chat from, who's manning the chat from Worcester. Um, but if anybody has any um, questions for Dr. Hendrick, I'm sure he'd be glad to answer those. If, <laughs> I, I would, and, if um, actually more uh, questions. and also, yeah, and if anybody has some additional questions for Chris, um, we can have her answer them too, and then we'll take a break while we set up the stage and people can take some refreshments and get ready for the panel discussion. The question is, um, how does um, Chris like to get input from the stakeholders for her current position? Yeah, so um, let me turn on the other because otherwise, yeah, I think people will leave on me. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I've experienced it with my own IT people that they will yell if I don't have a mic on. Okay, so the how do I get input from current stakeholders in, in the position I'm in now? So I head up our animal well-being program, which is all four of our protein species, chicken, beef, pork, and turkey, four-leggers and two-leggers, uh, sustainability efforts across the entire company, water, greenhouse gas, energy, palm oil, all sustainability and innovation. Um, it's easy when we have folks that we can find common ground. For those stakeholders that don't necessarily agree with some of the things, and I will use our animal well-being as a great example, um, I, have a, I have a dialogue with them. I have conversations with groups um, that would be considered more um, activist-like, and again, I try to listen and see where their concerns are. It's amazing. We can usually find something that we can agree on. Most of the time it is agree to disagree, uh, but I, I will have a professional dialogue with anyone that will have a professional dialogue. So it, it just, it, you just have to listen. I don't know if I answered your question, but... Yes, you know. so approach is primary qualitative. Listening session to a certain group. Did he come to you, or do you seek them out? 
Both. Both. And so um, in our business, we do get a lot of um, activist groups. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, we're, we, we are a, a, a large entity, and we have stubbed our toe on some things. And so can we do better? Absolutely. It's about continuous improvement. So what will happen is maybe I go to New York and meet with members of ASPCA. You know, maybe I go to Washington, D.C. and meet with members of HSUS. I also have members come in to our corporate office and have a dialogue. And we may end up working on some collaborative things together through research with other universities to try to address a problem. That's a great question. Worcester didn't have any questions at this point in time, but I did want to, since Sandy opened it up, just ask um, Dean, Acting Dean Hendrick to speak a little bit. You mentioned the concept of, of being an ally. and Can you talk a little bit more about the process for people to be allies well, across um, different groups, whether it's race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, but that concept just from the work that you have been doing? Because I think you said some important things about the fact, you know, Men need to talk about it and, and write about it, and it is, can, can be kind of freeing, but just some strategies to help us continue in that kind of conversation on that path. Sure. Well, um, you know, one of the things the, the college will be doing is following up with some more of the formal training opportunities that Bruce and I went through. So um, uh, we're consistently or continually having dialogue with the rest of the university about that. Um, uh, so make your, you know, avail yourself of opportunities to get, um, uh, you know, formal training in these. Really, for what Bruce and I, week-long immersive experience is very different than, you know, sitting through, uh, you know, uh, an afternoon training session or watching something online. So those immersive, very personal experiences, I would say, um, to strive for those. Um, I think the, um, you know, having the the confidence to, to um, approach colleagues, you know, to ask someone, um, you know, as a white man, what is it like for being a, you know, what's it like being a Latino female um, or male in a college like ours? What's it like being a member of the LGBT community uh, in this college? Uh, what are the sort of um, things that you face that I might not have um, knowledge or understanding of? So that willingness to step out um, and approach uh, people and gain a better understanding. There are less formal opportunities um, that we have that are still important. So Jeff Lejeune and some of our other chairs have gone through those. Um, Terry Niblack, who had to step out, um, been a very important resource as well. So um, I think it's becoming self-aware um, to the extent you can, talking with others, taking advantage of experiences, being mindful of things, taking advantage of the shorter, less formal opportunities that really are more tactics uh, oriented, but I don't want to minimize the importance of tactics as well. Does that help? Yes. Yeah, so to repeat the question, the, um, it re pertained to um, changes we made in hiring practices, but what are we doing a little earlier in the pipeline around recruiting and getting um, a diverse pool of applicants in the first place? So part of that is, is um, changing the, the kinds of things that we're, we're articulating in our position announcement, so asking people to speak to things. Um, you know, um, the experience has been if you ask people to talk about um, their interest or experience with, with working with members of underrepresented groups, it sends a message that that's something important to the college. And um, we have a very good example of a, a candidate we hired, um, a female racial minority, who said, you know, when I read that, um, I wasn't seeing that in other applications. And that's the kind of thing that really encouraged me to apply here and, and to think this might be the kind of place um, of which I want to be a part. So there are those things that we can do, I think, um, Better networking, um, 
you know, one of the issues is we're not the only ones that are trying and, and doing different things as well. So the competition um, is very acute. So again, that leveraging the brand that Ohio State has, um, making sure that this isn't something just members of search committees do, but deans and associate deans and department chairs are reaching out, inviting candidates um, when possible. Um, so there are a variety of those, again, kind of, in the end, sort of tactical, uh, tactical things that we do. Um, and it's just kind of anything we can do to kind of reach a little more deeply and a little more broadly. Um, but, you know, we do struggle with those. Um, and I think one of the conversations today will be about non-academic careers. And so competing with the private sector is another thing um, that uh, we have a challenge with as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or within the career. Are you doing anything specifically to address these different options? We have not yet. Um, it's one of those, uh, you know, postdocs is, exist in kind of this gray area between staff and faculty. Um, so we haven't uh, done anything concrete yet. It's something that's been on our minds. Um, I think, you know, um, activities and, and events um, uh, like the symposium, um, where we can focus a little bit more on that. I've been thinking that, you know, it'd be important for us to probably have some specific sessions with um, senior PhD students and postdocs, you know, about going around, how do you, you know, apply for jobs, interviewing skills, negotiating skills. So some of you are getting that today, but I think it's one of those things that we could potentially formalize a little bit more into the services or training we provide for, for postdocs and grad students. So the question is work-life balance. Um, there's no balance. Uh, work-life, and it's a, it's on one days it's work, on one days it's life. And so um, my personal thing is if you think that that teeter-totter is going to be balanced, you will do both of them half-assed. It's going to be some days that you are going to put in work. And some days you're going to have to spend time with the family or the dogs or the husband. But the key is you can't have everything perfect. It's okay to leave the house with dishes in the sink. It's okay to not have the laundry done, and it's okay to not bake something for the school. For those that have kids, the best thing that another um, career mom told me is find the homeroom person and give that person money and tell them, here's $100 for the school semester, you do with it what you find. It's for my kids, and you will feel good because you're supporting, but you won't be going to the grocery store at 11.30 at night getting Valentine's cookies. Trust me. The second is find the time to um, find me time. That work-life balance, you always hear about work, you hear about spouse, you hear about kids, you hear about husbands. I don't usually hear that says, find the me time. Find the me time. Whatever it is you do, if it's exercise or yoga or walk or read a book or what, whatever makes you feel good, if you have to put it on your calendar, then put it on your calendar. Because if you don't do that, you will fail. You will fail. So figure out how to spend some time in your own personal way to, to get recharged and rebalanced. Because if you are not straight and your personal brand is out of whack, 
the rest of your teeter-totter will tip. So anybody that says, oh, you can balance them both, they're lying to you. You're going to have to, it's going to go like this on a daily basis. But make sure that somewhere on that teeter-totter, you find time for yourself. Great question. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to see if there are any more questions for, for Ron, because I want to be cognizant of everybody's schedules. And if there are no more questions, to thank him for sharing and for being here and his support. And then I actually had a question for Chris. Um, it was about, you, you had a couple slides. One was about perception being reality. And I'm combining it with the slides that you had about the quotes and how the different scientists would be described differently. So how do you, and this is kind of looking at the gender aspect. So how, you know, as a woman, when you're perceived, if you are direct, if you are more like the first version of the scientist, that's not always what people want or expect. Um, and so then you wind up, some of us maybe wind up being labeled angry or hostile or aggressive, when if it was the opposite, it wouldn't necessarily be described the same. Yeah, great, that's a, that's a great comment. For those, I, I should have had it here, there's a great video um, that Pantene put out a couple years ago. Um, look up uh, the Pantene commercial on labels. It, it's really, really good, and it talks exactly about that, where they're showing a woman in, in a business room, and she's, she's kind of leaning forward on a table, I think, and then underneath it said, aggressive, and then the male is stoic. Um, and so it's, it's tough. It's a very tough balance, because if you do come across on that uh, forceful aggressive, um, you, can get a, you can get a label on there. And I don't have a clear answer for you on that. That's one of those that is very situational specific. You're gonna need to engage your audience. But I think what helps is all of the homework that you have done up into those areas or that time um, specifically on your personal brand, are you known as, hey, this person's pretty nice, she's pretty level-headed, she doesn't seem to fly off at the handle. What have you done prior to that situation where you then have to pull out the big guns or you have to be aggressive? Um, they will give you more credibility because they don't see that behavior all the time. But it's tough. It, it's, it's very tough, and you hopefully can um, have some peers or colleagues. I've had some wonderful male mentors that have um, been in a situation where they've, they've kind of stepped up either for me when there's been another person that had been a little bit more aggressive, or they have pushed me. The whole concept of sitting at the table, if you've not read Sheryl Sanders' book, Lean In, that is your homework assignment. It is a great book. And she talks about the fact that you need to go in and sit at that table. You take a chair. Because I know I, myself, and probably many of you, um, have been in a room or been in a situation, and we sit around the edge wallflowers. Nope, just go in there, sit, and watch the expression on people's faces when you do that. They will be amazed. But again, do your deep breaths, sit in there, be confident, know your stuff, and take a seat at the table. Great question. Thank you. Um, I think it's time for us to break. Um, help yourself to the food. Anything else we need to... Um, set up the podium here for our panel discussion, and we'll begin right around um, 1045. Thank you. <laughs>